Lake family. Welcome to the online service for the Church of St. Andrews. For those of you who it's your first time here, we say welcome. For our church family, we say we miss you and that we hope to see you soon. Thanks for joining us. Have a nice day. Good morning and the risen Lord be with you. Welcome to our service of online worship for this fifth Sunday of Easter as we celebrate the ascension of our Lord. And I begin today, as always, with our welcome message. We want to remind you this morning that you are welcome here. No matter where you have come from and no matter where you are going, no matter what you believe or doubt, no matter what you are feeling or just not feeling, no matter what you have or don't have, all of you are welcomed into this time of worship by a God who loves you, who knows you by name and wants to have a personal relationship with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now let's take a moment to just pause and center our hearts for worship as our organist, Bruce Histed, plays our opening prelude. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, for that. And, and now as we continue on in our worship and we move into our time of prayer, as always, I, I just want to say that your prayer concerns really do matter to us here. So if you have any kind of a prayer concern, please feel free to either message us on our Facebook page, or you can send us an email uh, on the link in the description below this video. And just remember, you don't need to be a member of this church or any church at all to request prayers. We wanna make sure that we're in prayer for everyone in our church family and for our community. And so as you are worshiping with us online this morning, I invite you to join me now in this time of prayer. O oh God of all grace, Jesus glorified you in his earthly life and prayed for our protection out of his humanity. 
fortify our faith that we may be steadfast and resist the worldly temptations prowling around us, looking to devour our fragile promises to you. Christ ascended. Restore, support, and strengthen us. O God of all grace, bolster the character and principles of those in political leadership on this earth, in this nation, and in our community, and steady them on the course of justice, mercy, and peace for all people of your creation. We ask that you would convict all of our leaders, reminding them that every single life matters and to put the health and safety of all people above everything else and every decision that they make. We pray especially for our doctors, our nurses, and all of our first responders and others who are on the front lines of this pandemic. Protect them and keep them safe. And we pray especially for those who are working on finding treatments and on a vaccine. We ask that you would work a miracle through their hands. Christ ascended, restore, support, and strengthen us. O God of all grace, rest your healing spirit upon all who are coping with chronic or life-threatening illnesses, and give rest to all those who give them love and care. Be with those who mourn this day, and remind them of the promise of your eternal kingdom. We join together now to pray for those in need here in our congregation and in our community. As our great physician, bring healing and comfort to those who need it most. Christ ascended, restore, support, and strengthen us. O oh God of all glory, O oh God of all grace, we pause in this moment of silence to offer you our other heartfelt intentions and all of our unspoken petitions. Christ ascended, restore, support, strengthen us. Holy God of power and glory, as we cast our fears and anxieties upon you, rekindle our desire to reflect upon and to rejoice in your presence and renew our willingness to be disciplined in the pursuit of the eternal glory in Christ and the life you have given us to live. We ask all these things through Jesus Christ, our ascended Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our sacred sanctifier, who lives and reigns with you, one God, now and forever. And we continue on in this spirit of prayer as together we say the words that Jesus himself taught us to pray. I invite you to say this at home with me out loud. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we will 
continue on in our worship as we move into our time of special music, and we welcome our own Jenny Kane, who will be playing La Valsa de Amelie for us from the movie Amelie. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Jenny. That was absolutely beautiful. And, and once again, we're just so happy that, that we can showcase all of the, the amazing talent, all the amazing musical talent that we have here in our church. And now we will continue on in our worship as we move into our scripture reading. And our gospel lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, the commissioning of the disciples. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. 
When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning, we're finishing up our sermon series called Easter Encounters. Now, we began our series by running with Mary Magdalene to the tomb on that first Easter morning, and we heard Jesus share with her a word of comfort when he called her name. Mary. Then we walked with those two disciples on the road to Emmaus and listened in as Jesus gave them a word of conversation, showing them how all the scriptures and the prophecies pointed to him. And then next, we gathered in that upper room, and, and we were amazed when Jesus just suddenly appeared through a locked door and gave that doubting disciple, Thomas, a word of confidence. And then last week, we listened as Jesus asked Simon Peter three times, Do you love me? restoring him and reconciling him to relationship and giving him a word of compassion. And now this morning, as we read and study Matthew chapter 28, we're going to see where Jesus gave his final instructions in the Great Commission. Now, most of you have probably heard this before. In fact, you can probably quote some of these words from memory. But, you know, sometimes we, we need to be reminded of the things that we already know. You know, what we have here in, in this short passage are the marching orders of our Lord and Savior Jesus, our sovereign King. And this command and commission, they, they were given to all of us collectively, but it's also given to each of us individually. Now, a lot of times, a person's last words are recorded and remembered because well, we think that they're important. You know, there's some funny last words out there. You know, Nostradamus, he, he once predicted, tomorrow at sunrise, I shall no longer be here. And of course, he was right. And then the philosopher John Paul Sartre, he once turned to his beloved partner, Simone de Beauvoir, and he said to her, I love you very much, my dear beaver. But then, you know, there's some profound last words that have been spoken. You know, for instance, when the great Sir Isaac Newton died, he was very humble. He said this, he said, I don't know what I may seem to the world, but as to myself, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself now and then and finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than the ordinary, while the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. And well, these are the last words that Jesus spoke before he ascended into heaven. And so I, I want you to, to pay close attention, not only to what he said, but also why he said it. You know, we may have heard these verses before, but, but we have to imprint them on our minds. We have to impress them on our hearts. You know, when we do these things, we'll come to, to three important discoveries that I'm going to be discussing this morning. 
We discover that we are enabled through his power. We discover that we are equipped with his program. And finally, we discover that we are encouraged by his promise to us. So first, we are enabled through his power. We are enabled through his power. And after the, the resurrection and before his ascension, Jesus came to the disciples and said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now that's a pretty bold statement. But what does it really mean? Well, you know, to, to just sort of put it in plain English, Jesus is saying that he is Lord. And, and, and he is. And, and Jesus is saying that he is the driving force behind all of creation. He is the driving force that sustains all of creation. And Jesus has all authority all throughout his creation. You know, it's, it's just as Paul said it, it, when he was in Athens, he said that it's in the Lord Jesus Christ that we live and move and have our being. So in a way, what Jesus is doing here is being subversive. You know, in our world today, in our postmodern culture, a lot of us have trouble accepting authority. A lot of us are, are skeptical of authority. You know, we're, we're cynical towards those in power. And it's easy, of course, to, to understand why. You know, we see corruption from the highest levels of government and, and in our corporations. We see bitterness and, and divisions all around. We, we see the exploitation at the, of the poor at the hands of the wealthy. And, and so I think this is, is one of the major reasons why in our age it's incredibly difficult for us to accept passages like this, you know, claims of absolute truth and, and claims of absolute authority, that we have to accept Jesus as Lord, that we have to submit to his authority. So in other words, it, it might be hard for us to hear that Jesus has all authority in today's world. It, it might be hard for us to hear that he has authority over every creature, every country, every culture. And it might be hard for us to hear that his gospel transcends every language, every nation, every race, and, and every rank. So before I can talk about what it means to submit to the authority of Jesus, I actually have to back up and, and talk about what his authority actually means. See, if you're on the fence about Christianity and you're watching this today, I, I can see how you, you might look at this passage and, and think that these are the words of, of some kind of tyrant, maybe even a divine tyrant. You know, that he's forcing everyone to just bow down and accept his authority. But let me just tell you outright that that's not what's going on here at all. You know, yes, Jesus Christ is Lord over all, but in a much different way than, than how we would typically understand that word, authority. You know, like I said, you know, we hear that word today, and probably the first thing that comes to our minds is, is these corrupt political leaders all over the world. But see, that kind of authority is broken. It, it, it's the product of our fallen world. It's a, it's a product of our fallen nature, and it's precisely why Jesus came in the flesh to subvert this kind of authority to subvert the broken authorities of this world. 
Now to illustrate this, we go back to the season of Lent. You know, it was sadly one of the last times that we were actually able to gather here in person together and worship as a church family. And we talked about the temptation of Jesus by Satan in the wilderness. Now, now what happens there is that Satan tries to tempt Jesus to take on power and authority in these broken and fallen forms. You know, he says, set yourself up as king over all the earth. You know, rule with an iron fist. Use your, your miracles as a demonstration of your power so that people will bow down to you. But Jesus rejects these things. He rejects that, that worldly sense of authority and power. And we also see this later on. You know, during Holy Week, where the, where the people are trying to goad him into being some kind of an earthly king and, and leading a big insurrection against Rome. He rejects the, the worldly sense of, of power and authority, the, the kind of power and authority that sadly we are all too familiar with. Now see, Jesus comes into the world. He, he becomes flesh to bring in a, a different kind of authority to, to usher in a new age, the age of the kingdom. He turns the, the corrupt worldly powers upside down. And Jesus does perform miracles of, as signs of this new kingdom. But what are they? They're miracles of healing casting out demons and, and oppressive forces, raising the dead to life, forgiving sins. In other words, he's liberating people. He's, he's setting them free from the things that hold them in bondage. You know, this is the kind of authority that Jesus brings. And what's more, when it comes to the cross, he emptied himself of all authority, and he surrendered himself to the authorities that oppressed and then ultimately executed him. And see, it's in this way that Jesus identifies himself with the poor, the, the marginalized, and, and the afflicted, and he condemns all the corrupt power structures of this world. And that's why he says that, that in his kingdom, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. So when we're talking about submission to the authority of Jesus, we're not talking about submitting ourselves to a cosmic and tyrannical authority. It's actually the complete opposite of that. We're submitting ourselves to the very force of life who sets us free, who heals us, and, and who can make us into a whole person. Our submission to, to him, to, to his will, to his authority, it, it sets us free from the bondage of, of all the broken forms of authority and power operating in this world. So we become part of an altogether different kind of kingdom. We become part of a kingdom that is even now bringing about a, a great reversal of the broken and fallen forms of authority and power in this world today. And like I've been saying in, in this series, this gospel message, is for all people in all the world. You know, not just a, a limited few, all people. You know, when he says all authority has been given to him, it means that there's no place that he doesn't belong. It means that there's no power that can stand against him, no matter how broken or evil it may be. And it means that there's no person 
that he can't use. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done or, or no matter what you haven't done. No, he's saying this power that I bring, this authority that I bring, you can be a part of it. You too can, can play an important position in this kingdom that I'm bringing into the world. We, yes, we can be a part of this change, this reversal that he wants to bring about. And I say this because we're enabled through his power. We're enabled through his power. You know, just look at, at verse 19. It says there, it says, go therefore, go therefore. It, it, it's plural. You know, it, it's, it's universal. He, he's not just saying that only some of us are supposed to go. He's not saying that the few, the, the talented, the effective, you know, those who are good at talking to people, that those are the ones that are supposed to go. No, it's... It's y'all, <laughs> it's all of you, all of you go. And what's more is this is universal in its scope, but it's, but it's also personal in its application. You know, you can't go like I can go, and I, I can't go like you can go. You know, you go in one direction and I go in another direction. You go one way, I go another way. You know, you go to those that you know, and I go to those that I know. You know, that's what I mean by being enabled by his power. You know, our Lord has, has given each one of us uh, a, a specific role, a, a specific position in the spreading of this new kingdom. You know, you might be the pitcher, I, I might be the the shortstop, but, but each one of us has been given a very unique calling. You know, you've been given a, a specific set of, of spiritual gifts to, to accomplish things that only you can accomplish. You know, that same power that, that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, it's in you, and I mean it. I mean, this is no exaggeration. So, so as we talk about authority and, and power this morning, and we think about all the, the corruption and the abuses of power in this world, know that you, you have been able through his power to bring about some kind of change, the, the same kind of change really that he did when he walked on this earth. Now that brings me to my second point. You know, what, what, what do we do with, with the power that he's given us? You know, how do we, how do we bring about that change? Well, you know, for that, we, we have to know that he's also equipped us with his program. He's equipped us with his program. You know, we have a tendency to, to make something that is really very simple we have a tendency to make it so very complicated. You know, this thing called, called the Great Commission that, that we hear in our, in our text today, it really isn't complicated. It, it's actually quite simple, and Jesus has, has really laid it out for us right here in these verses, and I'm going to explain all of it. You know, what are we supposed to do? Well, first, it, it says we, we bring them in. You know, that's what he says. You know, we look at it here and it, and it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. See, that's another beautiful thing about this authority that comes from our Lord. You know, I talked about this earlier in our, our sermon series. You know, it, it doesn't come by force. It, it doesn't come by compulsion. You know, the Lord doesn't force us. To accept him or, or his authority. The Lord doesn't demand that we submit to him. No, he invites us. He invites us to, to join with him, to, to partner with him, to, to bring about his kingdom on earth. You know, every single one of us then, as Christians, we are called. 
We are called to be in mission. We're called to share the hope of the resurrection and the, and the promise of his kingdom. We're called to bring about reconciliation, restoration, and healing to, to others just as he brought it to us. And we're called to, to set people free from the forces of authority and the corruption that are operating in this world and, and to show them that there is a better way. And you know, these last points, they, they, they really got me thinking, especially lately. You know, over the past several weeks as a society, we've, we've all been talking about and, and asking the question, you know, when can we get back to normal? When can life return to normal? But maybe this pandemic really is a call. Uh, an opportunity to, to take this awful, awful time and, and to bring something good out of it. You know, maybe it's a call to, to repentance and a call for introspection and, and reflection. You know, maybe we should all be asking ourselves, maybe we should all be asking ourselves, what kind of world do we really want to return to? Do we want to return to a world where there's so much corruption and greed? Do we want to return to a, a world where our environment is being exploited and destroyed? Do we want to return to a world of violence and racism and, and, and endless wars? You know, recently, I, I was on a, an interfaith Zoom meeting, and, and one of the leaders there shared a story uh, about how the youth group at, at their interfaith center, how they were all wrestling with that, that same question that I was just asking. And, and people of all different faith traditions, all of them came to the conclusion that they wanted to go back to better. Go back to better. I love that. The hope is that, that, that we might find a better way to, to be at peace within ourselves, with, with one another, and with the whole earth. And friends, I think we, we as Christians, we do that by living into the power of the resurrection and by living out our calling in the great commission to go back to better we have to be the hands and feet of jesus christ in the world to to work to create the world that he intends for us and now the next part of this program that we're called to do in the in the great commission is to put them under meaning that we're to, to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and, and of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we think about that, it, it's like, how did, how did Jesus begin his public ministry? Well, with being baptized and, and by identifying himself with us. And, and how did Jesus conclude his, his public ministry? Well, by commanding baptism right here. He commands it. So, so in baptism, he wants us to identify with him. You know, baptisms aren't just, you know, some optional thing. It, it, it's not just some kind of, you know, symbolic gesture. You know, no, this is, this is something supernatural that takes place. This is a celebration of, of something that God does in us you know we're to make disciples but we're also to mark disciples we're also to mark disciples now you might ask you know pastor what what difference does baptism really make well my friends it it makes a lot of difference 
You know, baptism is the image, the the picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when we're baptized, we become a part of that image. We, We die to our old selves and we're reborn as a new creation, a, a creation in his perfect image. You know, just to illustrate this, Paul says in the book of Romans, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. We're to disciple all nations. We're to baptize all believers. And then the program of the Great Commission says that we're to, we're to build them up. It says we're to teach others to observe all the things that I have commanded you. Now he commands us to, to, to go and, and make disciples, you know, not just you know, making these vague decisions for Christ, but, but real disciples. So in other words, he doesn't want us to just, you know, accept him in our hearts one time and then and then just sort of forget about him and push it all on the back burner. No, he wants us to make a lifelong commitment to seeking his face and in all things and to growing on our spiritual journeys and and growing into spiritual maturity. We're commissioned to help others go down that path. We lead them down that path. So we're to make them. We're to mark them. We're to mature them. And finally, we're to mobilize them. You know, we're told to to send them out. You know, our work is is never quite finished until the people that we lead to Christ are actually leading others to Christ. You know, if we're going to go back to better, we've got to make sure that we're all playing our parts on this kingdom mission of bringing about a a different kind of rule and, and authority on this earth. We're not merely to to be makers of disciples. We are to be makers of disciple makers. And we can do this because we're enabled through his power. We're equipped with his program. And third and finally, we're encouraged by his promise. We're encouraged by his promise. He says, you go and do these things. And he says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, even in the face of this world-changing pandemic, we we can't go around saying things. Things are just too bad. We we, we can't just hunker down and and just make a, a fort out of our own individual faith. No, we need to to stop wringing our our hands and and saying things like, hold down the fort. No, we need to start raising our hands and, and singing things like, onward Christian soldiers. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God is not dead. God is not distant or removed. You know, Jesus may have ascended into heaven in his physical form, but that power that raised him from the dead is still present in every single one of us. And he still has the the power 
to topple the broken authorities of this world and, and to rescue the perishing, to, to care for the dying and to snatch those from sin and the grave. So let me just be open and honest and, and, and transparent here. You know, I, I said it from the, the onset. You know, when I began this sermon series that, that this is an important time. For, for us to be in mission for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, this pandemic has wreaked havoc on us. It's, it's brought our whole society low. It, it, it's forced us to, to reevaluate the things that, that really matter in our own lives. And, and so we're all seeking, we're all looking for some kind of hope. But again and again, these Easter encounters, they, they all tell us that, that this hope, it, it really can't be found anywhere in this world. You know, that's why we have to be passionate about planting these gospel seeds, these Easter seeds, these resurrection seeds, wherever we can. Because out of this darkness and this death can come a resurrection, a going back to better. So even if it feels like Jesus is far away from you right now, be assured that those words, lo and go, that they are forever linked He'll never be more near to you than when you are out there serving and sharing the good news of the gospel and the Easter message. He's with you. He moves alongside of those who follow him and who obey him. You know, this command is, is preceded by the promise of his power. This command is followed by the promise of his presence. So his authority will be behind you. His spirit will be within you. This isn't an option. Now this is our responsibility. This is our privilege. And this is our joy. And so many Christian leaders from all around the world have said that this pandemic has taught us that the church isn't simply the, the buildings that we gather in. No, it's the people. It's the people, wherever we may be. And so even in this time of social distancing, we've got to find new ways to be the church, to bring the hope of the gospel and the resurrection to every single person on this planet. We'll grow out of this. We'll go back to better. And that's why, as a church and as Christians, our daily mission, our daily mission is to be the Great Commission, to bring all of our Easter encounters to all those whom we encounter. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now I invite you to join me as together we sing our closing hymn, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Thank you.
Thank you, Nancy and Bruce, for leading us in the singing of that hymn. And now we will conclude our worship with our closing benediction. The high point has been reached. The stone has rolled. The grave clothes have been folded. So now simply remember what he has told you. All authority in heaven and on earth is his. And so as we go from here, let us keep our faith in him. Thanks be to God. Amen.